people expect that a board option is just something that they fall into. Um, it takes a lot of time to build the skills that you need. Remember that you are at the apex of an organization and you are gauging where that organization goes next. So you really have to have a profound understanding of the key roles of what it is to be a board director. And that's not just showing up, fronting up and, and sort of being able to do the, um, the reading that's necessary. It's actually, it, it actually is a, a suite of skills that you gain as you go through your career. Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. A few weeks ago, I invited my friend Marian McLeod to be a guest on my podcast, the Job Hunting Podcast. I invited her because I thought it was time for us to address a question that many prospect clients and current clients of mine want to know more about. And that is, how do I build my non-executive director career? This is something that many executives aim to move towards, uh, to build a portfolio career towards the end of their tenure as professionals, where they hold a mix of permanent and operational roles and non-executive positions, and then slowly move towards having more and more non-executive directorships. It's not an easy task, and it's a very um, important strategy that needs to be considered and started much earlier than professionals think. Marion has extensive experience in non-executive directorships. She is an executive director herself with over 25 years being on several boards. I will add her full bio to the um, episode show notes, so please have a look at that. But more than that, she is a consultant who has helped many organizations run their boards more effectively. In addition to that, she facilitates the Australian Institute of Company Directors course. So she teaches a component, I think the strategy component of that program. If you're outside of the Australia, you may not know this, but the AICD or the Australian Institute of Company Directors has a very important um, company directors course that many of us aspire to do. And it's um, seen as the best practice approach if you want to be an executive director. So teaching in that program means that she has a lot of expertise in how to be an effective um, member of a boardroom. Marion is now developing her own content and online course to uh, teach professionals um, in the startup sector, SMEs, to have access to um, the content that she believes is really important for people who want to run boards, boards effectively. Maybe not the ASX listed boards, but the um, SME type boards, private boards, startup boards. So I will put a link below to her website so you can go and check it out how she runs it. But I thought it would be important for me to cross-reference some, some of my understanding of how I'm coaching my clients. And I was very glad that uh, Marion and I agreed on almost everything. I can't remember anything that we disagreed on, on how to prepare executives for boardroom positions in the future. And also the misinformation that exists out there in the market about getting board uh, positions. And I think if this is something that you aspire to do, that this is definitely an episode for you. We start off slowly and we talk about Rotary. Both Marion and I are Rotarians. She's the president of Australia's oldest Rotary Club, the Melbourne Rotary Club. I'm a member, a member of that club and I run the evening committee um, meeting. And um, we then, within that discussion, talk about Zoom meetings and how to um, 
the etiquette around about running Zoom meetings and how to be better prepared for that um, video conferencing format in a, in a professional way. We talk about um, risk management under COVID. And I didn't want to remove that conversation from the podcast interview because I thought there was so much juicy content there. And then about 15 to 20 minutes later, that's when we really sink our teeth into uh, the boardroom uh, part of the conversation, which I think many of you would really appreciate listening to. So if you're not interested in the beginning, just jump to that. And in the episode show notes, we also prepare um, timestamps so that you can go straight to where you want to land um, with the timestamps um, available to you there, okay? Enjoy this conversation with Mary and my Claude. Look her up, uh, find the details in the episode show notes, and I will see you next time. All yeah. right, so how have you been in this kind of COVID lockdown situation? You have such a big uh, job uh, with Rotary Club now that you're president. It's huge. And, and to be honest, um, I'm just going to get another cushion. I just feel like I've, I've sunk down. Um, it, to be honest, Renata, I, I think it would have been very hard to do it without, um, without COVID because I had no idea how, um, how very... Um, are you still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you disappeared for a minute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I had no idea how... Um, how how demanding it was going to be and i i can't quite work out whether it's demanding because of covid or whether it's demanding um whether it's it would have been demanding anyway because i i remember mary um she did it when um when she was still working and i can't imagine if i'd been doing it when i was still working it would have been she told me that once that she did it when she was still working and i thought well that's impressive I yeah. remember my grandfather doing it while he was still working. It was all consuming. Mm. I remember my grandmother not liking Rotary very much <laughs> <laughs> because of that. Is he was governor twice, I think, my grandfather. Oh, was he? Mm. Uh, I, I think it depends on, you know, the, the, there's a huge expectation because this is the 100th anniversary. Mm. And... Um, and I think that's putting another layer on it yeah. um, at the same time as we're having to, because we're in, under, you know, in COVID, we've had to reinvent our meetings, reinvent, you know, everything. We've re had to reinvent the fundraisings, so everything, and it's just been full on. And I think th there was a rhythm to it that was disrupted, and then you had to, like you said, reinvent things. That takes a lot of energy and time to do. So definitely... It, probably took more of your time just because you have to think about it it's yeah. not the same old rotary you know that you were used to you have to kind of think about every single step because even when i only run one evening a month one meeting a month for the evening uh sessions and i'm like have to think about the run sheet so thoroughly to yeah. make that one yeah. hour work well and yeah. even then it doesn't sometimes as you know yeah. No, it's, yeah but look compared to you, you know some some of the uh some of the clubs have done it really really well um mm. uh but i think melbourne we, we have managed to sort of have that um that that fairly high standard but there are some where you know even today you 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 know it's torture <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have some clubs disappeared because of COVID in terms of their inability to transition to Zoom and all of that, you know, that? No, no. It, 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 okay. Fascinatingly, um, okay. I actually think, uh, you know, Zoom has, has, has liberated um, a whole lot of very different groups. And I, it, it's interesting because it's actually the older people who've taken to Zoom and, you um, and are working it better than even the younger ones. The younger ones are still using their, you know, their texting and their social media. Whereas I think Zoom has been a lifesaver for older people and they've all jumped straight on board. And there's an interesting dynamic that's happening with Zoom um, around, uh, you know, because there's a whole lot of personal interactions that happen when you're in a room together. Mm that are nuanced and that you don't actually see. And it's been an equalizer because men's and women's voices are equally well 
listen to, if you like, because the usual, the, the psychological reference points, you know, about who's looking at who and all of those things are lost because you can't tell. That's a very good point. I'm going to pay yeah. more attention to that now. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it's, it's, it's been interesting. It's been interesting to see, but there's an etiquette that hasn't developed yet. Because I can remember, in the, you know, old enough to have been around at the start of mobile phones. And, yes. and um, when mobile phones first started, the phone would ring and it would just take over. And yes. people would, you know, you'd be in a meeting and the phone would ring and people would just answer the phone. Yes. Uh, and then they realized that actually that's, that's quite rude because mm-hmm. somebody has made the time to meet with you and, you know, yes. and, uh, and you're allowing that to be interrupted by somebody who hasn't, you know, and, uh, and then an etiquette sort of developed. So the, the Zoom etiquette hasn't really developed yet. And it's, it's interesting watching it in action to see. And it's I also, agree. It's and also it's also much pretty much like a, because I deal with uh, clients that are being interviewed for jobs, uh, they are all being interviewed via Zoom. Um, and the same way that you are very careful about your attire and your body language when you walk into a boardroom job interview meeting, the background has become really important. And some people haven't really realized that yet. For me, it's kind of, yeah, of course. But uh, if you have a, a bland uh, background or an unprofessional background and you have another equally great candidate because candidates are all always fantastic you know i'm dealing with senior as x they're all good but if you have another candidate who has a background that's very professional that will be people will be biased towards that person no matter what they say you know it's it's unconscious. It's, it's not really something that they can control. Yeah. So I've been telling people to be very careful. Sometimes when people book just a one hour consultation with me for a prep, they do, I, I do get that a lot. And I say, I know you are not thinking about this, but you have to, that background, that ironing board, <laughs> to be like, who is ironing during COVID? Just to yeah. put it away. <laughs> So yeah, those things are are very interesting. That's and exactly some big right. blunders too that I've heard about. You know, partners not knowing that the Zoom was on and walking with very li- little attire. <laughs> Just be- behind. It's, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the drum. I don't know if you you ever watch the drum, but it, yeah, it, I don't the- watch TV much. But tell me. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, the drum is, is really good because it unpicks the, the, the current affairs of the day. And I like that. I watch it because I, I watch the 7 p.m. and sometimes I get to the drum because it's not 7 yet. Yeah, so yeah. it's good. Yeah. And it, um, but it gives it, it gives it time. So, for example, last night they were unpicking the great debate between mm-hmm. Biden and Trump. Oh, gosh, and, that was you know, half a yeah, but half an hour of going through that, you really see it from, and with different perspectives, you really get an understanding of it. Um, but there's a couple of people who regularly appear on that show, and one always comes from her bedroom, and you just go, and the bed's not properly made, and it's and it's and it's just there's something about you know being on public television with a backdrop that's that intimate. It's your bedroom. Yes. It's yes. very confronting because I you know, kind of feel like a keeping Tom. You know, you're sort of, why am I looking at your bed? <laughs> did you do you follow Alan Collar? Con- yes, yes, yes. Did you see his post? No. From yesterday. No, no. Oh, oh! I no. have to send you. I cannot even get started on how amazing. He, so he's very. He has like a one minute. Uh, time during the 7 p.m. news to talk about yeah. finances and he every day he has three books on top of his desk and a, a, a pot plant and yeah. it's always a money plant yesterday the man the plant was different it was a different plant and I think it's the hope plant all right okay and the books the names of the books together uh, oh my god I can't even go there it's just so fantastic Let me just see if I can find very quickly because it's worth it. There you go here. So it's the prayer plant. Sorry, the prayer plant and the books. uh, I I will have to send you, but it's something about um, sending a message about the debate in America. 
Um, like um, the power in America being in borrowed time, like. Oh, he's taking his cue from Michelle Obama. Did you see her? No. Yeah, because you know that th- her her um the the um deputy uh, Republican um, candidate who I can't remember the name of, she went out onto a stage, you know, doing the traditional, the bright pink suit and the, you know, and, and oh, really yes, hard. yes, yes, yes. And it she's, was, it was an ad- a, a, a very sort of, the, the one that screamed a lot. Yes, yes. yes it it yes. didn't go down well at all. No. Yeah, and then yes. Michelle Obama went out and she just went out with this tiny little necklace and it, everybody could see there was something on it, but they couldn't quite work it out. Uh-huh. And they went closer and closer and closer, and um, and it said vote. And it was so subtle, but it it landed really strongly. And the the woman who made the it was a custom piece. The woman who made the custom piece was inundated with people wanting the the, the same necklace, oh. but but it had so much more of an impact subtly. It was almost subliminal, you know. Oh, wow. I'm trying to find the name of the books, but I, I will send it to you later. It was all the rage last night. It was so good. So how um, is business going, Renata? Because it must be a really tricky time. How is what? Sorry? Business. Business. You, because it must um, be... Uh, the coaching is going well. I have a, quite a, a good number of clients. I have to be careful not to get too many clients, in fact, yeah. because I'm um, re launching my online course. I have an online course for job hunters that I launched earlier this year before COVID. Oh, wonderful. Yes. And at that time, I had a very um, small um, mailing list and um, followers on social media. And now I have a much bigger mailing list and and followers. So I want to relaunch it and I want to redesign it with more the COVID content, which you just mentioned, like the Zoom etiquette. That's not in my course because I created it in 2019 and it was all about the shaking hands and the boardroom etiquette. It wasn't about the um, um the zoom and the, just to give you a, an example i have a client and she is c suite and her first round in a selection uh process for a ceo role was a five question interview straight to camera on a video format which she didn't do well yeah imagine that yeah imagine yeah. doing that like somebody who, with her experience having been a ceo for that long having so much to offer this job this uh, uh, as a prospect but not being able to connect with the camera and answer those five questions so it's a whole new set of skills that i need to not only um, discuss with my current clients Mm -hmm. with this podcast but also put into my online course Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i'm I'm sort of spending a lot of time still in developing that side of my business. But uh, in terms of the what my company used to do uh, as a business consultancy, that has stopped. All my retainers are now uh, done. I had one retainer, sorry, one uh, little project that we did with Austrade recently that was really good. And that started because of COVID. So that was the only one that we captured during the COVID times, but the Mm -hmm. others were like bricks and mortar organizations that have shut down, you know, and those projects that were really important back then, you know, um, things like um, uh, green energy and um, doing um, projects for um, incubators for young girls to learn how to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. That, schools are have all the bigger fish to fry and um, organizations are not worried about energy consumption anymore because they're not even in their offices <laughs> I know. so I these know, it's going to, it's to, to be really challenging because they've um they changed the solvency requirements in the corporations act for mm. you know for the period that um okay that we were dealing with lockdown and um, Alan Kohler actually mentioned it a few, a couple of weeks ago, that normally there's a normal um, turnover of um, of companies, you know, companies that go into administration, that stopped 
because because they removed the solvency requirement and because um, because they were being supported with the the job keeper, but he's anticipating a huge increase in insolvency uh, and companies going to the wall when it comes to um, when it comes to sort of December January, so it's going to be really quite quite tragic. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. I'll have a look. Mm. I I think that um, what has happened is that um, I've slowly um, building my reputation as a coach, which was something that I've always kept before when I had full-time jobs, I've always kept on the side. You know, Mm. if there was a whisper that somebody needed a coach, a friend would recommend me and I would coach one client on the side whilst having a full-time job. Yeah. Now I'm slowly building up this business of being a full-time coach, which I love and I've always wanted to do. I just didn't think it was going to be at this stage of my life. I thought it was going to be a bit sort of like further down the track (laughs) yes i love that i'm doing it now though and i think you know the timing couldn't be better um it's it's working really well i love the podcasting side of things to amplify my reputation because i'm quite well known in the melbourne circle with a few people but the the podcast just allows me to uh reach out to uh, more um potential clients because it's an online course. The idea is getting that framework that I've been using since my time at the Monash MBA when I was the career manager over there and get that framework that I use with my clients and teach that online so people can download me and have me. It's much cheaper for them too, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good have idea. You been keeping, have you been keeping an eye on what's happening at Monash? Because they've got huge redundancies there, I think. They have huge redundancies across the board in higher ed. And yeah. it's, um, it, it's really um, a, mo- a, a, a um, model, a higher education model that is heavily um, uh, based on having international students. Mm. Yeah. And, it, and it's the, the risk has always been let's diversify the international students, but never, what if they never come, (laughs) you know? And, and honestly, even personally, I've never ever considered if my parents get sick, all I need to do is hop on a plane and go and see them. I've always thought of to myself, it's okay that I'm overseas Mm. because in 24 hours I can be there with them. Yeah. I never thought that this could be the future for us where I would have to ask for permission to leave my country. Um, This is really bizarre. So we didn't have, I know the, 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 the wonderful team at Monash that does the risk management team there is fantastic. They're really thorough. I can't tell you how important it is for a large university, a large enterprise like Monash with contracts everywhere, partnerships all over the world to have a very good team. This is just beyond surreal, right? Yeah. Do you know this is funny though? Because um, Renata, because I've been running the um, strategy and risk at um, at the AICD for quite a long time now, and um, two things that are are you know you know are stark when you reflect on it now is that quite often we would have conversations about um, higher education and the fact that, they're, that they, the risk they were carrying with international students was very high. But the second thing is the number of scientists that I had coming through that said, nobody is listening. A pandemic is imminent. And when I think back, I don't know if you were around when Nicola Roxon, remember with the SARS, the mm-hmm. first outbreak of SARS? Yes. Nicola Roxon took it really seriously. And the rest of us were all going, oh, poo-poo. Um, but she knew what it could mean because she'd been listening to the scientists. Yes. And nobody else was. And, and SARS didn't happen to be the pandemic, but no. COVID is. And, you know, and she had, because she brought in, she brought in, you know, millions of vaccines and got us all vaccinated and, and it just didn't eventuate. Yes. But um, but it's been on the cards for a long time. It's just that it's yes. it's one of those ones like climate change. We won't do anything about it until it's too late. 
No, and I have a great uh, podcast that I did. Coincidentally, I, I got in touch with this um, economist, American guy. He's a specialist in disaster avoidance. Mm. And I was booked to interview him for the podcast months in advance to talk about redundancies and how to plan for a career. But by the time I reached, we had the, the time to talk, it was the beginning of COVID. So it was such a good podcast mm. and um, such a good interview. And what he said is exactly what you're saying. Our instincts are, have been developed to deal with tigers. That's it. And not with the slow moving threats like climate change or a pandemic. So we mm-hmm. hear about it and in theory, we, we understand it, but we don't know how to plan. We're not built for that. Mm-hmm. So um, he gave lots of different ideas of what we could do at that point in time. And he also explains how he works with clients. Um, I was kind of very aware that these things could happen because of my role at the John Monash Foundation and the fact that we sent Alex Phelan to Georgetown. And Alex is one of the most prominent Australians in this field, always on the ABC, always on the news, Mm -hmm. talking about um, pandemics and epidemics. Even at the time of Ebola, she was always in the news talking about it. And she has that... um, Uh, role of developing the international policies to manage uh, um, how how to manage things across borders which is the hardest thing to do and but the other thing is I come from a country of epidemics Marion (laughs) you know that the role of rotary in Brazil in fact in controlling uh, epidemics is really really important um, yeah. because uh, health and sanitation in a country like Brazil that has experienced Zika, um, dengue, all of those sort of, you know, yellow fever, malaria, all of those horrible things that we have lived with for so long and they're so hard to control. Dengue is the hardest thing to control and it's deadly. It's deadly, mm. yeah. And you've had some interesting politicians too. Yes, they don't help. <laughs> they it makes, don't makes help. Trump feel a bit, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, I, I, I think it will be interesting to see how um, organizations adjust. And I'd love to talk to you about boards because we have all of these amazing professionals, uh, senior executives, in fact, unemployed. I'm coaching people. And the conversation often uh, uh, comes to me as yes I'd love to either have a full-time job or maybe I can be a, a an ed maybe I can be an executive director and like oh my god what how can I put this nicely to you <laughs> and um and then we can I, I I discuss that with a client and it's pretty clear that that's you know not an option yet for them and it and I also make it very clear that if this is a, a professional and career pathway that they want to pursue, they need to start thinking about it now for five years from now, for 10 years from now. It's a long-term investment. What has happened to me as well, unfortunately, is that somebody says, oh, I really wish I could invest in you. But this is what has happened. I've invested so much money with this other coaching program that told me they would get me a board role and they didn't. So there are people milking, you know, uh, from professionals that are naive, this concept that, yes, you can get a, 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 um, a director's role if you pay me and I'll help you and nothing happens. And I can't tell you how many times I've been told um, that that's happening out there in the market. Mm. And I know for a fact that board roles are incredibly rare and hard to get. And I don't know how you can actually go to people and say, give me money and I'll get you a board role. Mm. And it's mm. a lot of money they're asking too. Mm. Mm. So let's, let's go through it stage by stage. I want, okay. you are a much more qualified person to tell my listeners um, about the importance of getting ready for board positions if that's what they want to do in the future, right? Okay, okay. So I, I'd love you to tell us about what you do. What, what is your 
uh, role with the Australian Institute of Company Directors and your career as well, how you got there. Let's start with that. Okay. Well, my career is, is, um, is very diverse. So I've been with the Australian Institute of Company Directors probably about, oh my goodness, it must be 15 years, I think now. Um, but my career, you, you probably picked the accent straight away. Um, uh, but I've actually been in Australia for about 40 years. So I started in science way back. Uh, my alma mater, Aberdeen University, just turns 525 years young uh, this year. So um, from that science background, I actually had my first career here in um, television. And I ended up as a director in television. And from there, I went on and set up a, a holiday resort with my husband. He and I used to ski together uh, up in the high country. Uh, unfortunately, skiing is what we did best together. So we, um, we um, went our separate ways. And I then went and did uh, a business MBA with the Melbourne Business School. And then, very fortunately, I was at the start of uh, mobiles. And I joined Telstra when mobiles was just taking off. And it gave me that platform to uh, test all of my business skills uh, at the time. And it was just the most amazing ride. I don't think anybody could have an opportunity like that. You were the second person I interviewed that says Telstra was the best landing pad for me. It was great place to learn mm. corporate world. Yeah, uh, good. The first one is Michelle <laughs> Redfern. I don't know if you know her. Uh, which part of Telstra was she in? Was she? Don't know. She was there for like 10 years, I think. Yeah, yeah, likewise, likewise. Telstra was sort of quite schizophrenic back then because part of it had come from the Postmasters General, which meant mm -hmm. that that was where people went for a job for life. And then you had this other highly dynamic part of the, the business that was forging a completely new business in the mobiles environment. So um, that, that period was just the best time. And at the same time, I got involved in my, my governance background. So that's when I became a commissioner in local government. And then um, for my sins, I stood and got elected as a councillor. And I think local government is one of those places where you really learn some of the hard yards of governance because it's got a strong framework, um, but you learn how to filter um, the important from um, the urgent and also to actually unearth the real issues, because the volume of material that you have to go through gives you that just that practical um, uh, background in how to add value as a board director. So it wasn't long after when I left Telstra, I left Telstra to set up my own business. And that was a portfolio business um, back then. So I, I joined the Australian Institute of Company Directors on their council. I would um, had my first uh, board uh, role um, as a chair with the CAE. And, um, and it was after I left the ICD that I then went back as a, as a facilitator. But I started building some governance programs, strategy workshops and, and uh, risk programs with the corporate world and also with smaller businesses. Um, so that sort of was the platform for my board career. Um, but I've had 25 years on, on boards. And uh, as you said earlier, um, when you were mentioning, people expect that, that a board option is just something that they fall into. Um, it takes a lot of time to build the skills that you need. Remember that you are at the apex of an organization and you are gauging where that organization goes next. So you really have to have a profound understanding of the key roles of what it is to be a board director. And that's not just showing up, fronting up and, and sort of being able to do the, um, the reading that's necessary. It's actually, it, it actually is a, a suite of skills that you gain as you go through your career. And, uh, and I put them into sort of four buckets, right? So the first bucket is um, you're there to set the strategy for the organization. And that means understanding what it is to set the strategy for the near, the medium, and the long term, and manage all of the risks associated with that. So you're taking advantage of the opportunities that are coming before you, 
And then you've got to make sure that you've managed the risks associated with those. Once you've formulated that strategy, and as I say, it can be very different. The tactical response to it can be very different in the near, medium, and long term. But you're there for the long-term viability of the organization. You then have to um, select the right CEO for that. And that means understanding the skills that are going to deliver on that strategy. That means you need to understand a lot about the, the human dynamic. Then you've also got to be fully compliant. So you've got financial and regulatory obligations. You need to fully understand those. And a lot of people who first set out to join a board don't really want to mess with the numbers, but you absolutely have to understand how a balanced sheet is constructed, how a P&L is constructed, and cash, you know, what your cash flow is doing. And you'll see from all of the, the, the um, corporate disasters like Centro and Hardy's, each time they were let down by lack of understanding of their obligations as a director. And finally, you've got that fiduciary duty, which is the responsibility to act on behalf of shareholders, right? So you have to act in the best collective interests of those shareholders. So if I haven't made you a little wary about a, a role as a, as a board director by now, um, then I failed, haven't I, Renata? <laughs> <laughs> so the four buckets are strategy, compliance. Yeah. The third would be financials. No, compliance actually involves both your legal and your financial obligations. Okay. But you need to understand both because they're yeah. both tied. Legal so and financial. Is the compliance bucket. Yeah. And then you've got your CEO. The CEO is the instrument the of what you're doing. Okay. Because the, the, the interesting thing in a board, and that's what makes it very tricky for people who've been in business for a long time, is that they're used to their sec success being tied to what they do, right? So doing the job. Um, when you're on a board, you're actually, the, the most powerful tool that you have is the question because you can't do anything. The CEO is the instrument of your doing. Yes. So you need to be able to interrogate that CEO in the right way to understand that they're actually delivering what you want them to deliver. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the, the fiduciary duty is that duty to your shareholders. Okay. But having said that, you know, you now have a lot of, of peripheral obligations that sit around those, which relate to your risk management. And that's things like your reputation, right? Mm -hmm. So you not only are employing a CEO for... The, um, the strategy that you want to deliver, but you will have seen with QBE and AMP recently, um, they have to be protective of the reputation of the company because the reputation, right, is the trust that you have with your community. And that community is all of the stakeholders, your customers, your shareholders, your regulators. And if you break faith with that trust and your reputation goes, you've got huge problems. And Mary, considering all of this, what would be the prerequisites for a non-executive board director to have to enable that person to be a good candidate to apply for a role or be considered for a role? Well, it's very tricky. It's very tricky because the, when they talk about the, the attributes of a board director, these are usually over and above all of the skills they've developed throughout a career because It's not just the knowledge that you need, you know, I mean, doing the AICD course or doing my governance uh, academy course is only the, the starting point. That's the knowledge base. Then you need the experience on top of that. Then you need to have certain attributes and those attributes are around um, courage and that's courage born of understanding yourself, right? So the courage to be a little vulnerable, the courage to ask the right questions. And, you know, the best board directors I've ever come across just know how to ask the right question at the right time. Because what that does is, you know, the questioning is so powerful. It, um, it actually forces the person you're asking the question of to think. And in that thinking comes the resolution to the problem that you have before you. So you need to have that courage. You need to have the extensive experience. You have to have a deep understanding of business and its drivers. You know, and I often quote in my, my sessions that, you know, when you fully understand your business and its drivers, that's when it becomes an Amazon. That's when it becomes 
a really powerful business. And the story of McDonald's is the best one to describe that. You know, McDonald's was plugging away, selling hamburgers until the owner realized that what the business driver really was, was real estate. It was where they were positioning these, these, um, these outlets. Mm -hmm. So suddenly your business is about real estate. You make completely different decisions than if you think you're in hamburgers, you know? And so you really need to have a deep understanding of business. I think you probably need some war wounds, you know? So um, with those war wounds come the real learnings. You know, if everything is going easy in your life, that's not where you learn. You learn when you've got those periods in the wilderness or, you know, and, and Apple's a gr great example of that. You know, Steve Jobs did not make Apple a success until he'd had quite a few years in the wilderness. And it was when he came back from that experience that he understood what made the business really tick. And it was iTunes then that just took Apple into the stratosphere. So you need a few of those war wounds. You absolutely have to have those, that breadth of, of business skills. And that's why often they want you to have, you know, operational um, background, P&L responsibility, so that you really know your finances, your legal and your strategic and risk management. So it's sort of bringing all of those things together. And once you and, and the other uh, misconception as well marion is the the time commitment that boards yeah. um take uh of uh, a board member and the pay yes because those really blue chip board positions that pay really really well are far and few between am i right oh absolutely and you know i get people to do a little bit of basic maths right so you've got um, you've got a, a hundred um, boards in the ESX 100. Um, they have probably got about six to eight board members, right? They turn over every ten years or so, um, and they're on six to ten boards collectively around that 100. And so you're talking about maybe ten positions a year that are coming up. And they're, they're not going to go to the general public. They're going to go to people who've already got significant board experience. Yes. Um, other than those, look, there are a whole lot of private companies and there's, um, there's a, a variety of, of pay grades around all of those. But people often leave their executive careers where they're on a really significant salary. A lot of um, uh, there's... there's um, uh, there's a, a level of tenure there um, that isn't necessarily with a board career. And they jump into to the, the board portfolio thinking that they're going to have an equivalent um, remuneration. And it's not necessarily the case. Mm. And there's a lot of work. You think it's not the 10 meetings a year that is the, the workload. The 10 meetings maybe go for half a day to a day. But in preparation for each of those, you've got another day's work in, in, just in preparation. Then you've got all of the committees. And then there's an expectation that you're actually across the, the context. So the shifting world of a board director. So you're across all of the, the, um, the, um, the legal cases that, that inform where, where the board community is moving to. And in recent times, that has been a huge shift towards your responsibility around culture. Um, you've also got to attend all of the meetings, uh, the sub, sub uh, committees of the board. And if you get into difficult times, the board needs to be uh, engaged far more frequently. In fact, they'll be meeting daily uh, if it's a crisis. And, uh, and in between all of that, you have to understand the actual business you're in, the industry that you're in, and you have to be doing the research and all of that to get a good sense of it. So there's a lot more work than turning up to 10 meetings a year, which is, I think, what some people think. Yes, absolutely. So if you're not um, aiming at those very top board roles, what's the more realistic beginning for a new non-executive director? How would people go into this sort of uh, portfolio of board positions? 
Well, I think, as you said earlier, the, the important thing is to start early and to start whenever you get an opportunity. And those opportunities, strangely enough, often come in the not-for-profit sector and in smaller boards. And the interesting thing is that um, the disciplines that those smaller boards and the not-for-profits actually teach you are probably not the best disciplines for the bigger boards mm -hmm. because people bring you on because of the skills that they see in you and then they expect you to do those. So they bring you on because you're good at strategy or they bring you on because you're good at the finances and suddenly you're the treasurer. Um, and that confuses the boundaries. And yeah. it's those confused boundaries that can confuse people when they then get on to the bigger boards because on the bigger boards, the boundaries are much clearer. And if you start getting involved in operations, you will undermine your management, your executive management. And you need to be really careful not to do that. So it can set some bad behaviors, but it does give you um, some insights. And it can also, if you start with some of your passion boards, so you start with something you've got a passion around, you may well meet people who also have a passion for that and are also on bigger boards. Mm -hmm. And they get to see you in action. But that also means that you have to be on your game Yes. even in the smaller boards, because yeah. as, as we were mentioning earlier on, mm -hmm. you're always on show and how you behave and how you um, interact. And there was an interesting statistic came out the other day that I think people need to be aware of, that 90% of the success of a board comes from the dynamics within that board. Mm. And people often feel that, um, that, you know, that it's important to showcase their, um, their intellect or their um, skills when in fact they should be understanding the dynamic in the boardroom and acting in the right way. So it's not important for you to put a point across if somebody else has already done it. Mm. You have to learn how to sit with some silence as well as putting yourself forward and understand that dynamic in the boardroom and if you do that well and you're doing it with people around you, you may well get a sponsor into that bigger boardroom. Yes. And that's where it starts. It's a long game. It's not a short game. Yes. And it's, um, as you said, in the non-profit board, it's a very different proposition even. There's way more rowing with the operations team rather than just steering, correct? So. Those boundaries get very fluid. Mm. Having said that, there are some very large not-for-profits. And Correct. the large not-for-profits operate very similarly to the corporates. You're right, yes. Yeah. And, how, and how about um, uh, government? And I've seen Victorian government, I, I don't, don't know if they're still recruiting heavily, but a few years ago they were really actively recruiting, um, especially female and... Um, trying to diversify their um, uh, board members. I think they call them council members or advisory members. I've done a, a stint with them a few years ago. Um, but is that still happening? And are those paid roles? I, I can't remember if they are or not. It, it very much depends. Um, mm. Government is often a very good way to start. Um, mm. But be really clear on what they're looking for in the board director role. They tend to be a little bit more formulaic. So, you know, they'll have minister's appointments if it's a statutory board or they'll have um, a certain proportion of the directors that have to be appointed by departments. Or So there's a whole lot of rules around. You need to understand the, the, the rules that you're dealing with and then understand what skills you're bringing to that board and bring those on top of what's expected of a board director because what's expected of a, direct, a board director is a full understanding of your gov governance obligations. Mm -hmm. And so you need to understand the, the um, constitution or the rules of association or whatever it is, depending on yeah. the, the type of board um, and know what it is that you're expected to bring and then the specialization that they might be looking for. Yeah. And look, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to fit because often with the government boards, um, I've been on a few. Uh, the CA was a statutory uh, authority. Uh, I was on V Line, I was on MECWA, uh, not MECWA, um, MetLink, which mm -hmm. was also a government board. And, um, and they're very formulaic about their, their um, pay scales. Um, but the demands are very different too. And so you can be bound by both uh, a ministerial direction and by um, your, the Corporations Act and, 
and you need to understand that whole context. Marion, um, how do people then prepare their applications? What I have found, uh, having been a CEO or working very closely with boards in my previous employment, is I've seen 99.9% of the positions being filled by the interdependencies and the relationships of the board members. And they come up with great names and great people, but I haven't, I don't remember the board positions being widely advertised or the interest in sort of finding people that they didn't know already. That I think concerns me um, and it could be the, that I'm in the nonprofit sector and in, in the sort of nonprofit associations and so on. And, and I want to, you to kind of uh, run us through uh, um, how a, a, a public company would do it and the best way for a qualified candidate to go about um, looking for, for opportunities like that because there are lots of brokers out there as well and I, I, I want us to understand if there is value in working with a broker or if there is value to work with an executive search company that um, does uh, the, the hunting, the, the, the search or if this is really about who you know and getting a network of champions, you know, getting proper mentoring from, from board members that can then in the future uh, think of you when an opportunity comes up. Yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty complex, Renata. I'll try and unpick it a little bit. Having been on boards for over 25 years, um, I'd say that the, the world of boards has changed radically. And I think that's largely because um, directors are being held to account more and more under the Corporations Act. So the four key elements of the Corporations Act you need to be aware of is that you're, you've got several duties, right? The four main duties. The first is your duty of care and diligence. Um, and you do have a little bit of an escape route there with the business judgment rule. But the expectation is that you're acting with the, the degree of care and diligence that a reasonable person would be expected to do. The second one is to act in good faith. And that's in the best interests of the, the, the company for a proper purpose. Then you've got the obligation or, or duty not to improperly use your position. Um, and the last one is not to improperly use information. Now, there have been a number of case studies that have highlighted in the past where directors have actually contravened a couple of those. And those have been um, a stark reminder to directors to try and do things the right way. So most board directors today um, are the result of a board selection process going through one of the, the key headhunter groups. Um, having said that, uh, everybody um, would suggest that if you can get a sponsor, right, that's how you get onto the shortlist. Then it's up to you. Um, sponsors can help guide you to what um, the board is really looking for. So the board will be looking for, and, and nowadays most boards do this, they do a skills matrix of the board. So there's a whole lot of, of technical skills that they want. They want someone on that board who has deep financial skills. They'll want someone with deep legal skills. They'll want somebody with the deep business skills of the business, deep technical skills. And then they want people who've had, you know, extensive careers in business. Um, they may want marketing. They may want strategy. Um, and then they'll want a suite of softer skills. So that's the fit with the board. And it, as part of, of their risk management in the past, it was much easier to bring people in that you knew, um, but that then exposed you to your duties as a director to, to contravening those. So it's been this balancing act of, well, I know this person, I know that they're not so risky, put them on the short list and then see how, how they go from there. Mm -hmm. Having said that, a lot of boards now are using their advisory committees or advisory boards 
to help to assess somebody ahead of bringing them onto the board. Because the, the tricky thing with bringing a board director on, it's hard to get them off. Yes. <laughs> and, and don't so I they're know not, it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they just don't want yeah. to, they don't want to go there. So, um, so more and more, if you can get yourself onto an advisory board, mm. they get to see you in action. And if they see you in action, and that's the same thing about playing the, the board career as a long game, getting onto a small not-for-profit mm. where there are people who might be on bigger boards, mm -hmm. gives them an opportunity to see you in action, yes. then that's a better way to go. Yes. Okay. That's fantastic. That's good. And um, this might be too, um, too much detail. Sorry, but I have to ask, what's the deal with the resume for the board directors? You know, um, I have been pretty much doing my own thing but some people come to me and say oh you don't do a resume for the board role it's a different resume and I'm like I'm sh pretty sure that after being a CEO three times people will kind of be okay with the resume that you've got you know like you know like people are confused about what information needs to go in the resume that they're sending out. I think that they, this is me not being a psychologist, analyzing the psychology. The resume is something they can control and yes. they want to have it perfectly done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when in fact that is the not really as important as other aspects of the decision-making process of getting yeah. them on the board. Yeah. Am I right? I, th I think what happens with a board resume, and, and I h hate to say this, but I think women in particular are vulnerable to this because oh, yeah. women tend to want to keep proving what they can do. Yes, and yes, what yes. the board is looking for is not what you've done because you wouldn't be there if you haven't done stuff. Yeah. You know? They want to know how you're going to contribute. So mm -hmm. they want you to have that future focus and, and share that sort of, strategic alignment with them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so when you're putting your board cv together what they're wanting to see is that you've understood and it's it, it, take it back to basic marketing you know it's who's your audience yeah. these these are a small group of people that are going to invite you to join them at the table and they want to know that you can sit at the table with them so it's not like sending you off to do a job, yes. you're going to be sitting at the table with them. Yes. And so they want to know that you've understood the business, mm -hmm. that you've understood what you can do to contribute to that business. The other stuff's a given. They want to see it, but that's why they talk about the board CV as being one page. Um, it's got, you just need the high level. You know, I've been a CEO. I think that tells you everything. You don't yeah. need to say, you know, I, you know, I built the infrastructure for this or I built the whatever for that. The CEO role says you know how to manage a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you understand how to take the strategy forward. What they want to see when they, you put the CV, that, that front page together for them is... I think I've understood your business in the context of today. Mm -hmm. I think I understand the skills you're looking for, right? And this is what I think I would do for you, right? And this is how I've done it in my other governance, you know, other board rules. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very different audience you're looking at yes. and you turn it around for that audience. Yes. Does that make sense to you? Oh, that absolutely makes sense. And that's exactly, you know, so when, when I'm working with a, a client they usually end up with a, a very easy to adapt cover letter template a very uh, good master resume that they will probably use to apply for for full-time roles because they're still seeking full-time employment but they will also end up with a one pager if not two or three I personally have two Uh, mm. Because I am um, a candidate for entering roles mm. with a couple of brokers. So mm. I have a one pager um, that's focused um, mainly on my CEO and C level ex experience, mm. and another one pager based uh, on my business development experience. Mm. And I think what you've highlighted there, Renata, <laughs> is you actually need to know your audience and you really yeah. do need to tailor it. You know, and, and it shouldn't be static because yes. 
if you're going for a role in a health organization, you need to explain why you'd be interested in a health organization, Correct. what you know about it. That's very different from going to for a role in transport, mm. you know? And so you need to be able to understand the audience that you, you're dealing with. And it may be if it's, if it's a government board that you understand um, your obligations to the, the incumbent government and, and what that means for the role. So, yeah. you know. But I think what's really important as well, and I think, you know, not all of my clients get this, um, you know, yet. Hopefully they will once they're done with me. Um, is you can have all the great papers in a word, your collateral, your marketing material about yourself. But if you don't have the network and, the, and you're not visibly out there as a thought leader, um, presenting yourself in that space that you say you're good at, that won't do. Um, so LinkedIn, for example, in this time of COVID becomes really important because if you're positioning yourself for a board position and on LinkedIn you are liking um, posts or your you know, profile isn't de well-developed or your comments are just off-brand, it's just not going to cut it. People are not going to believe that you are at that level to be, as you said, at the apex of an organization. So you need to be on-brand all the time. I absolutely. Could not agree more, yeah. Renata. And it's, um, and it's also about, um, you know, how you present yourself because mm -hmm. it, it, it is really important. You are saying something about yourself in, in everything that you do and, uh, you know, I mean, I can remember when, <laughs> when we had a, a CEO at Telstra who decided that, you know, why, why are we, we're a tech company, why are we wearing business suits? And so he said, I think we should be, you know, we should be more casual in our wear. And so the very next day, everybody came in in casual wear and some people didn't get it. Casual wear is not thongs and shorts. <laughs> casual wear is professional casual wear, right? Yeah. And you can't be meeting um, clients and meeting, um, meeting uh, you know, suppliers and looking professional mm -hmm. if you're in thongs, or, uh, uh, flip flops, is it? Flip flops? Yes. And, um, and um, you know, shorts. Mm -hmm. And they don't really uh, necessarily, um, you know, understand that, that you, you are you have to be on message all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really um, um, important. And, and look, the, those are sort of extreme examples, but sometimes it's the subtleties that gets people. Exactly. You know, it's when you're not, you're not, it's not so extreme. It's just quite subtle. But if you're competing against amazing candidates, because that's always a competition, and yeah. you have to go through all the stages of getting people through, you know, different rounds to see who is going to win at the end. You know, just the smallest little detail mm. will cut you off the short list. Mm. Mm. Is there I mean, anything else? I mean, it seems like you have something else there. No, no, no. I was just thinking, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of, um, of one of your podcasts earlier with um, uh, Associate Professor Catherine Ball, and she quoted John Lennon. And she said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a, a, a lovely quote because um, often I can reflect on, on my life, for example, and see that um, it evolved and, um, and it, it, it was life happening to me whilst I was making other plans. Um, but somewhere in there, there actually was a sense of a plan of sorts. And I think probably in, in sort of summing up, Anybody who's starting a, a board career, it may not go the way you want, but you do need to start early and plan strategically, right? That's when life happens because I would never have gone on to a board if I hadn't had my MBA behind me, had all of that business career behind me, had all the other things behind me. And even although the, 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 the initial board was a bit of a surprise, um, when I look back on it, it was serendipity. It was all that, that harnessing of luck because you were prepared. So you do need to plan strategically. The other thing is you do need to network. You need to understand what networking is all about and it needs to be active and you need to do it consistently. 
don't leave your pre-board career too early. So stay in your career. And I can remember um, Katie Leahy of Corn Ferry saying she gets people coming in all the time, uh, expecting that having been a CEO or a CEO of some organization, they can just launch themselves into a board career. And she said, they don't understand they've left their careers too early. They haven't consolidated and they can yes. often find themselves floundering. Yes. And do try and find a sponsor out there. And I, the other good example of that um, was Gail Kelly. And I heard her talk just the other day on a, um, a, another podcast. And she had some pivotal moments in her life. And each of those pivotal moments, right, were the result of having a really good sponsor who believed in her. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the difference between sort of just an, an ordinary trajectory, if you like, and that stellar career that she's had. And in each, each occasion, it was a sponsor who believed in her that got her forward. So there's a few tips at the end. Yeah. Uh, be strategic, network, don't leave your, board career, your, your, your earlier career too early and find a good sponsor. That's wonderful. And, and Marianne, if people want to touch base with you, they should find you at the Australian Governance Academy. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yes. we will link the website on the sh episode show notes so that people can search for it and see what you offer and see your, um, um, what, what is it, a, um, consulting, well, coaching? The Australian Governance Academy gives you all the prerequisites to starting your board careers. So cool. it's very similar to the AICDs. The AICDs, um, well, it's not very similar. I should say it's, it's completely different in its format and it only gives you the, the technical aspects. The AICD is probably the course you need to do when you're ready to launch your board career because that also gives you the networks. Yes, okay, good. Wonderful. Okay. I'll link the link uh, on the episode show notes so everybody can find you easily. Thank Lovely you. Lovely talking to you, Renata, and thank you for all your support with our Horizons planning. That was fantastic. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview with Marianne McLeod. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to follow. And most importantly, why don't you subscribe to my newsletter? I will send you a newsletter weekly, every Tuesday morning, Australian Eastern Standard Time, with the new podcast and some great articles about career development for you to read and get ready for your next job. Bye for now.